first, thank you for coming back today. Uh, it stills a little bit of confidence in myself that you didn't completely abandon me after day one. Uh, before we get started with stuff on the computer, we're going to start with an activity. So I need everybody, at least in pairs, for one person in your pair to come up and grab a stack of pancakes that I have here. So you can, you can work in partners if you want, or you can work by yourself. But if uh, everybody who's working needs to have a stack of pancakes. Come on up, get your pancakes. And I think I have enough, even if you have a partner, you can both have a stack. Matter what stack? No. They're all the same. Okay, so we're going to do a little programming without computers this morning. Uh, what you have in front of you are a stack of pancakes. And this activity has two parts. The first part is a puzzle, and then the second part is the programming. So for the puzzle, you'll start by shuffling your pancakes so that they're in some random order, like the picture there on the left, in a random order. The second thing that you'll do is sort the pancakes so that they're in order from largest to smallest, just like the picture on the right. Now, there's only one rule, and it's that you only have one operation available to you. And that operation is to insert a spatula anywhere you want inside of that stack of pancakes and flip all of the pancakes above the spatula. That's the only operation that you have available to you. And I'm gonna show you exactly what that looks like because sometimes it gets confusing. So here I have a stack of pancakes. You can see that the pancakes are not in order. Let me grab a stack of pancakes. I have a stack of pancakes. You can see that they're not in order and I have a spatula. I don't have spatulas for you, so you'll have to use your imaginations or your hands <laughs> or your Jedi mind tricks. Um, so you'll, you'll take your spatula, your imaginary hand spatula. You'll put it between any, anywhere in the stack that you want. It's totally up to you. But once you pick a spot, you will grab all of those pancakes, whoops, all of those pancakes above the spatula and then you will flip that entire sub stack of pancakes as a whole and put it back down. Everybody understand? Have any questions about that? That is the only operation that you have available to you. You can do it as many times as you want and it's totally up to you where you stick the spatula each time. Your call. Once you solve the puzzle, there is a second part. Some of you will solve it really fast. Some of you will take a little bit longer and that's okay. When you solve the puzzle though, then you're ready to move on to the second part. The second part is to write your solution to that stack of pancakes as a set of instructions for somebody else to perform. If your instructions are good, then that means we could hand that set of instructions to anybody and they would be able to create a sorted list of pancakes regardless of the beginning state of the pancakes regardless of the number of pancakes in the stack and without them even knowing what the goal is. They will just read your instructions, perform your instructions, and magically end up with a stack of sorted pancakes. Any questions? Okay, if you have questions, feel free to shout them out. Uh, and also feel free to work with each other. Ready, set, go.
Yeah, you can put your spatula underneath the entire stack if you want to. When you've solved the puzzle a few times and you feel like you have a generalized solution, try to write down your instructions or type them up if you have a laptop so that you can give them to your partner to try out. And if you have instructions that you think are good, but you don't have a partner to test them out on, just uh, holler at us and either Matt or myself can come and, and be your robot. <laughs> Write them down. Well, you can you can type them if you want. Trust me, you'll want to have them written down before you start telling them.
You got something? All right, Matt, you want to come be a robot for Jasmine? Okay, so when you are, uh, just a quick show of hands, it's been about 10 minutes. Quick show of hands, how many people have at least solved the puzzle at least one time? Okay, everybody has, that's good. How many people feel like they could solve this puzzle with any pancakes in any shuffled order, except for infinite pancakes? Okay, so when you are, uh, when you have your instructions ready, we'll work on this for about five more minutes. When you have your instructions ready and somebody is being your robot, remember that the robot should be able to perform your instructions and complete the goal regardless of the beginning state of the pancakes. So if they shuffle them in some order that you didn't have, they should still be able to complete it. And it shouldn't matter how many pancakes are in the stack. So if they take one pancake out or if they added another pancake or if there were only two pancakes in the stack, your instructions should still work for them. So if you're a robot and you really want to test somebody, take a pancake and toss it out to see if their instructions still work. Right. You need a robot? Then try to go crazy. Because you need to say, we'll say, not 
Even if they could, it would have been a fine set. It would be good. Yes. Now, at the bottom of the biggest one on the bar, but it's not even quite to the next sort of so that I think is a solid algorithm that would work. It's not the most efficient, but we don't need things in the We just need a solution to the that's the first time I've probably done this, I think, like half a dozen times. That's the first time I've discovered that many strategies. Oh, now I'm interested. Now I'm interested. What's that? What? First time for this strategy. Yeah. Different? Mm hmm. It's less efficient than a bubble. Well, I mean, <laughs> that's what it sounds like. So what's your professional answer? Put the spatula beneath the largest unsorted pancake, flip, and then flip the whole stack. Now the, the bottom pancake <laughs> is part of the sorted stack, so it can be ignored. What about uh, iterate through the stack when the pancake size decreases? So when the pancake size decreases, flip that largest pancake and everything on top and then the smallest pancake the, the, the simplest thing to do is just to find the largest unsorted pancake flip it and then flip the whole stack the whole unsorted stack i want to fight let's go i got one <laughs> Mark just unsorted. Mm -hmm. Flip from there and then flip the whole stack. Yep. Now that pancake is part of the sorted stack. Mm -hmm. So you just continue to keep doing it. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how to get that. Okay, so we're going to put a button in that. I really hate to like interrupt you in the middle of of a deep thought process, but we have other things to talk about today. So we're gonna put a button in that. Uh, fortunately though, the stuff that we're going to cover today, by the end of today, you will be able to write this puzzle as a program and the solution as a program by the end of the lesson today. In fact, if we have extra time today, maybe we'll do it together or maybe we'll send you home with some homework. But for now, we're going to move on. Oh, by the way, if you guys want to take those pancakes with you, you are more than welcome to. If you do not want them, though, please give them back to me so I can reuse them. You don't want to eat them. Do not recommend. <clears throat> okay, so today we're going to cover some intermediate topics. This includes um, some advanced, more advanced data structures than what you experienced last time. We'll also talk about exceptions and error handling. Then we'll also talk about how you can organize your code so that it's easier to navigate uh, and find what you're looking for. And then the last thing that we'll talk about today is how to interact with files. So reading files, writing files, and processing the contents. If you are following along and you get stuck, uh, it's okay to interrupt me like I said yesterday. It's also okay to just follow uh, what I'm doing on the screen. You don't have to do it simultaneously. If that flusters you, then, then don't bother trying to do that. This is being recorded and posted on YouTube and it's, it's actually happening right now. So as soon as you leave the workshop today, you can go back to your office or your room or your house and watch the presentation again. Um, and the slides are available online as well. 
Okay, so the first thing that we're going to talk about are lists. We've already experienced variables which can hold a single value, such as a person's name or a person's age. A list is exactly what it sounds like. It's a single variable that contains multiple values. We can use lists to store any type of data that we encounter inside of Python. Um, just like a variable, there's a name to reference that list, a symbolic name that has meaning to us as programmers, as human programmers. We can modify lists, so we can take things out of the list, we can change things in the list, we can add things onto a list. Um, and lists can be recursive. We can make a list of lists if we wanted to. And those lists can contain other lists. Any data type can be put inside of a list in Python. So uh, open Visual Studio Code real quick. Oops. So we're going to make some lists. So to make, to start, a list is a variable. A list will be stored in a variable. So you need to give your list a name, a name that's meaningful for whatever the list is containing. Frequently, what I like to do as a convention when I'm naming my lists is I like to give it a plural name that describes exactly what's inside of it. So if I were storing, uh, let's say, a list of favorite movies, then I would call my list movies. And if I want, I can, I can put things into that list right away. So I'll, I'll put an equal sign as the assignment operator, and then I'll use square brackets to tell Python that this is a list. And inside of those square brackets, I will put the things that I want to be in that list. So <clears throat> maybe somebody can shout out their favorite movie. OK, I heard Space Jam. <laughs> Star Wars. What else? Matrix. Anything else? By the way, you said Star Wars. Which one? Acceptable. <clears throat> so what you'll notice here, uh, I have this list. It's just a collection of items that are separated by commas. Lists don't have to be uh, heterogeneous. You can put, right now it's a list of strings, a list of text items. I can put numbers in here as well. Python doesn't care. It's not going to force me to use the same data type within the list. I can, I can do whatever I want with it. For now, though, we'll just have a list of uh, strings. I can modify the contents of that list. So if I want to change the first item, maybe, uh, maybe I found out recently that Michael Jordan isn't an upstanding human being, and Space Jam is no longer my favorite movie. So I want to replace that with uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit. So I want to replace the first item in that list. The easiest way to do that is to tell Python to reference the first item in that list and then set it equal to some new value. <clears throat> so in Python, when you reference a list, you'll use the name of the list. And then you can access individual items by using square brackets and then a numerical index. The first item is always zero in Python. In other programming languages, less popular and more frustrating ones, the first item is indexed at one. But in Python, in every programming language that matters, the first index is zero. <clears throat> so in this case, this should change the value of Space Jam to now be Who Framed Roger Rabbit. And we can prove that to ourselves by just adding a print statement. So if we print movies, what do you think will be shown on the screen? Yeah, the whole list. I'm going to do that twice. I'm going to do it after I create the list, and then I'll do it again after I change the first item in the list. So the first time it prints, we can see it prints Space Jam, then Star Wars, then The Matrix. The second time, we can see that Space Jam has now changed to Who Framed Roger Rabbit. And the other items remain the same. 
So that's how you can modify the contents of a list simply by referencing an individual item. You can also reference an individual item if you just want to look at the contents of a list. So now I'll make these two small changes to my program. So that now instead of printing the entire list, I'm just going to print the first item in the list. Space Jam has changed to Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Sometimes, probably most of the time, you won't know the contents of the list when you first declare your variable. You may not know what should be in the list until later on. Fortunately, you can add things to a list. So we'll, uh, we'll do that with the append function. In Python, the syntax for calling functions that are members of an object is the dot operator. We'll actually talk a little bit more about this later today. But for now, you just need to recognize that append is a function that belongs to the variable movies. And because it's a function, as we learned yesterday, when you're calling a function, you use the name of the function followed by an open, close, open and close parentheses. And in this case, this function wants to know, it has to know, what we want to append to the list. So in this case, maybe we'll want to add the movie uh, Infinity Wars. So again, we will uh, we'll print the list before we add anything to it, and then we'll print the list after just to, just to prove to ourselves that our program is working. So here we can see that at first the list is empty, there's nothing inside of it, and then we can see that one item has been added. It is also possible to insert items in the middle of a list if you'd like to. <clears throat> and if you don't remember, let's say that you're writing a Python program and you don't remember what the name of the function is for inserting stuff into the middle of a list. <clears throat> one of the one nice thing about Python, especially with the interactive terminal, and I will start, is that you can ask Python for help. This is done through a function called help, and you just send it the thing that you want help on. For example, I want help on lists, so I will say help list. And here it gives me information about the list. Let me make this a little, a little better. It gives me a bunch of, uh, there we go, space bar. It gives me a bunch of uh, functions there that I can use. You'll notice that a bunch of these to start have two underscores. In Python, the convention for anything that starts with two underscores means that it's used internally by the class, and you probably don't want to use it outside of the class. So we're just using this class. We're not inside of it. So we will kind of just ignore all of those underscore ones. And now we get to the non-underscored ones. So we see append, there's a clear, there's a copy, there's a count. So this can return the number of occurrences of a value. That might be useful if you want to see if Infinity Wars is in your list more than once, then you can ask Python to just count the number of times it appears in that list. <clears throat> we can ask for the index of a value. So this will search our list and tell us where that item appears inside of it. And here we can see the insert function. So it says if we want to insert an item into the list, we're going to pass it an index where we want it to be inserted, and the object that we want to insert. This self keyword here just refers to the list itself, and we'll talk more about that uh, later today. But for now, I just want you to, to know that the help function exists, and it's there for providing you with built-in documentation. You don't even have to have access to the internet to look stuff up with Python. And it also works with variables. I could create my variable inside here, and I can ask for help with that variable. And it will give me the exact same thing. Python says, hey, that's a list. Let me show you what you can do with a list. And I'm just pressing spacebar there to, to scroll through. <clears throat> so that's built into Python, <clears throat> the help function there. So if we want to insert, let's, uh, let's add something else to our list. Um, Flubber, everybody loves Flubber. And 
Sound of Music. There we go. Okay, so we'll uh, we'll print that list of movies. And we can see it has our three movies in there. If we want to insert one into the middle of the list, uh, we're going to use the insert function that we just learned about. And here's another nice feature of, this is actually not a feature of Python, but a feature of Visual Studio Code with the Python extension that we installed yesterday. When you start typing the name of a function and open the parentheses, Visual Studio Code can provide you with help built into your editor to tell you what it's expecting for that function. So it's telling us here, <clears throat> the insert function expects an index and it expects an object. And that by providing an index and an object, Python will insert that object before the, the specified index. It can also provide that same help if you hit the control key and space bar. So here, if I'm using my movies list, and I'm not sure what the name of the function is, I can hit control space bar, and it will bring up a list of all of the members for that variable. So here I can see there's the insert function right there. I can click on it, add my parentheses, and then it tells me how to use it. It's all built in, and it's very nice. Sometimes it doesn't work, but usually it does, and it's nice. So we can insert. Uh, So usually it will pop up by itself. Here I'll just press the dot and you'll see that it pops up by itself. If you hit escape, it goes away. If you want to get it back, you can just hit control space bar and it will do that. And it's also, it's also pretty intelligent about the code that you have. So you can see there that it recognizes, hey, it looks like you're typing movies. I've seen that elsewhere in your code. This is probably what you want. It just saves you a little bit of typing. It also makes it nice if you don't remember exactly what you called something earlier. Okay, so I'm going to insert something before position one. I'm going to insert back to the future two. Now remember, when I said one, remember that lists in Python are zero indexed. So when I said to insert back to the future two, before index one, that means before flubber, because flubber is in index position one. If I had said index position zero, then it would have gone before infinity wars, and it would have been the first item in the list. We can prove that to ourselves. Like so. So if you want to put something at the beginning of the list, this is how you can do that. <clears throat> Python has some very nice language features for working with lists that almost no other programming languages feature. Let's say that you wanted to access the last item in the list. We know from looking at our code that there are four items in this list, which means that the last item will be at which index position? it out. Yeah, three. There are four items in the list, which means the first item will be zero, the second item will be one, the third item will be two, and the last item will be three. So if we run this, we should see the last movie in our list will be Sound of Music. That's movie Sound of Music. But what if we didn't know how long the list was? What if there was a bunch of other code that was dynamically adding things to the list? And we had no idea how long the list was. How would, we, how would we print the last item in the list? Any ideas? Say that a little louder. You could do that, like you could write a loop to check, start at zero and then count to the end. And then when, when there's nothing at the end of the list and you know that the one before that was the last one. So that would work. Uh, fortunately, Python actually has a feature built in 
tell us the size of the list. And that's the length function, L-E-N. So we can give that to Python with a list. And it will tell us exactly how long our list is. Size of list four. And if the size of the list is four, then what is the index of the last item in the list? It'll be three. It'll be one less than the length. So we could take this length, put it inside of our square brackets, and subtract one. And this will always give us the last item in the list. That's not unique to Python, though. That would work in any programming language where you can obtain the length of a list. Python makes stuff like this a little bit easier by allowing you to index a list using negative values. So if I ask Python for the negative first item in the list, it will give me the last item in the list. If I ask for the negative second item in the list, it will give me the second to last item in the list. <clears throat> Another nice thing about Python when working with lists is that it also allows you to easily slice a list. Maybe you're only interested in the top three movies. In Python, you can slice a list by using a colon inside of the square brackets. So if we're only interested in the first three items in the list, we can tell Python, grab everything from the beginning of the list to position three. And that's going to print the first three items in the list. If we want the sum sub list, we can also indicate the starting position. Let's put a one there instead. <clears throat> so here, this is only giving us two movies. It's skipping the first one and giving us the next two. <clears throat> we can also, like we at the beginning, we showed you that you can grab the first three items. You can also grab the last three items by telling Python or the last every item after the first n. So we can grab from position three to the end. Now these probably aren't features that you'll use very often, but when you need them, this functionality will save you like 10 lines of code every single time. And it's literally one character that gives you that ability. And being able to index things uh, using negative values to go backwards through the list will save you a lot of time and effort as well. <clears throat> Another thing that you can do that's easy with Python is you can sort lists using some built-in functions. So I'm going to make a new list of numbers. And I'll just make some random numbers here. And apparently, I've exceeded my profile storage space. So here I have a list of random numbers. If I wanted to sort that list, well, I could you know, write some lame sorting algorithm that takes my list to be sorted and does some stuff. But fortunately, Python allows me to not have to be that smart. Python will let me just call the sorted function and send it a list. Lists are very, very powerful. You probably won't write a useful program that doesn't use a list. In other programming languages, you may have heard them referred to as arrays or vectors, but they're all talking about the same thing. Ultimately, they're talking about a collection of items. Another type of collection that is immensely useful. Oh, real quick, quick side note. Um, besides lists, there are other list-like things. 
that you will encounter in Python. One of them is called a tuple. A tuple is like a list, except that you can't change the items in it. The syntax that differentiates a list from a tuple is that a tuple uses parentheses. So here I have a tuple of two items. When you're thinking about when you should use a tuple and when you should use a list, it's important to know that in a tuple, the order of the items usually indicates some specific meaning. For example, for coordinates, the first item usually means the X coordinate. The second item usually means the Y coordinate. It wouldn't make sense to sort this list, right? Because then the Y coordinate might become the first item and that would be completely nonsensical. So lists actually, or sorry, tuples actually can't be sorted. You can't even change the value of a tuple. Most of the time, you probably don't want to use a tuple. You probably want to use a list. But if you see parentheses like this, if you see something that looks like a list but with parentheses, know that it's a tuple and it's like a list. You can still access items inside the list just or inside the tuple just like you would a list. It's zero index and you use the square brackets, but you can't change those values. <clears throat> Python also supports sets. Sets are also like lists, except that in a set, you cannot have any duplicate items. You can only have unique items. And sets come with a set of operations that apply to uh, sets in the mathematical sense. So you can do unions, you can do intersections, you can perform a difference. Um, but you probably will not use those much, if ever. Just know that they exist in Python. And if you do need to use that sort of thing, Python makes your life very easy. <clears throat> Another type of collection that is immensely useful in Python is the dictionary. A dictionary is, is like a list, except with a list, we index things with numbers starting at zero. So the first item is zero, the second item is one. A dictionary can be indexed with things other than numbers. You can use numbers as well, but you can use other things like strings, for example, text. You could think of Python dictionaries just like a regular dictionary where you know one piece of information, but you want to know something associated with it. For example, you know a word, but you want to know the definition of the word. And so you would use a dictionary to look up the word to retrieve its definition. You can also think of it like a phone book. You might know somebody's name, but you need to know their phone number. And so the phone book is organized by people's names. And so you can look someone up by their name to find out what their phone number is. To use a dictionary in Python, the syntax looks like this. Um, let's see, what do we wanna make a dictionary of? Let's make a dictionary of options for our program. Just like a list and other variables, you have to give it a name so that you can reference it later. We'll use the equal sign as the assignment operator. So we're going to provide this variable with a value. And to start our dictionary, we're going to put a open and close mustache bracket. Those are the curly braces that are above the square braces. <clears throat> um, and I'm going to do mine where I have each each key and value pair on a separate line. Python allows you to do that. It doesn't force you to put everything on the same line, which is nice because it'll make it a lot more readable for us. So maybe I'm going to put um, some phone numbers in here. We'll put my phone number, so my name. I'm going, I want to index things by people's names. I want to look these things up by people's names. So I'm going to use the name as the key. Then I'm going to put a colon, and then the value can be whatever I want it to be. So I'm just going to make up a phone number since this is going to be on YouTube. So now my dictionary will contain one record that is a key and value pair. I can look up this key. I'm sorry, I can look up this value by referencing this key. If I want to add more things to my dictionary, I can just add a comma and add another row. Yes, a dictionary is case sensitive. So you can have two separate keys that have different cases. Yes. 
Yeah, good question. If I wanted to have two values, two values sounds an awful lot like bingo. So maybe I have more than one phone number. So from this square bracket to this square bracket is a list. And now I'm storing that list as the value for this key. So are you able to label each one of those values? So you want to, like say you wanted to have their address and their phone number, you label it and say, okay, go here and get the address. That sounds an awful lot like a dictionary. Let's see what our list looks like if we try to print it out. Our dictionary, rather. <clears throat> so it's not very pretty. It's not very pretty to look at. But we do see there is a key called DOM. It has a list. We see that there's a key called DOM with a capital D. And it has a dictionary. And now we can look things up inside this dictionary. So my dictionary, we called it options, but then we started putting phone numbers in there. So we're, we're going to change this to people, or maybe we'll call it a directory. So if we want to look up a specific item in this directory, it's just like looking things up in a list, except our keys are the keys that we specified here. So if I want to look up lowercase dom, then I put two square brackets, and then the key that I want to look up. So here I see just the record for lowercase dom. If I change that to a capital D, it'll give me the record for, it'll give me, uh, it'll give me an error. Oh, I changed this D also, somehow. So now it gives me the record for capital dom. You can use almost any type. Any type that is immutable in Python can be used as a key. Immutable just means that it can't be changed, um, which applies to all strings. It also applies to integers, and it applies to some types of objects, which we'll talk about later today. Most of the time, though, when you're using a dictionary, the keys that you will want to look things up by are usually either strings of text or their numbers. Question here? How about the next search? Yeah, great question. So we can, if we know the name that we want to look up, we can look it up just with the square brackets. But what if you don't know the name that you want to look up? What if you want to go the other way around? What if you have some value and you want to find the key that's associated with that value. So one way to do that, let's um, first, let's make our data a little more homogenous. Let's, uh, let's put somebody else in here. And let's make my record match his. So it has an address and a phone number. Okay, so now I have two records that have the same format. You might notice that here I specified phone first on the DOM record and on the mat record, I specified address first. It doesn't matter. The, the order of the keys is sort of irrelevant in Python. You can rely on the order as of Python 3.7, um, but for now it doesn't really matter for, for what we're doing. Uh, you can define it in any order that you want. So. What I can do next is I can use a loop to iterate through this list. And actually, let me make sure. Yeah, our next slide is actually about loops. So we'll go ahead and do this now. 
So if we want to get a list of all of the values of all of the uh, of all of the keys that are in here, we know that we have to have a key in order to look something up, right? In order to look something up in the directory, we have to know what key to use. But one thing that Python provides to us for dictionaries is this keys function. If I call that function, and we'll just print it out to the screen so we can see what it looks like, we'll see that it gives us what looks like a list of those keys. And in fact, we can put that in a variable And then we can use that variable like a list. If you have a list and you want to print everything inside of that list, you can do that with a for loop in Python. Python makes for loops way easier than other languages because you don't need to know anything about the internal structure of the list or of any collection. All that you need to know about the collection is that it's a collection and it can be iterated. So to do that, I'm going to type the word for the name of the variable that I want to use to reference the items inside the list, the word in, and then the name of the list that I want to enumerate, followed by a colon. You'll notice when I do that, Python indents the next line, indicating to me that it's expecting a list of instructions. So what this will do is Python will run through for each name in the list names. It will perform whatever instructions I put down below indented in. So I can print each name and we'll see what that looks like here. There's a name Dom and there's a name Matt. And now that we have that name, as a variable, we can use it in the same way that we would use any other variable. And in this case, we want to use it to look up items in our directory. So just like before, we use the name of our variable that has our directory, then square brackets, and then the key that we want to use to index into that dictionary. In this case, the key that we want to use is stored inside of a variable called name. The value of this variable is going to be replaced with each value inside this names list. And this names list comes from the keys from the directory. So if we run this again, now we'll see that it prints the individual's name and it prints the record associated with them inside of that dictionary. And now that we know that we can pull each item in the dictionary one by one, we can do whatever we want with it. For example, we can take this value, let's put it into a variable, and then let's check that variable for some specific value. Maybe we want to find the person that has this phone number, 555-555-5555. So we will ask the question if, that phone number is equal to, remember two equal signs are the equality operator in Python for comparison. If that phone number is equal to the record we're currently looking at, remember that record is a dictionary and we don't want to compare this phone number to this whole dictionary. That wouldn't make sense. We just want to compare it to the phone number index phone. If this phone number is equal to the current records phone number, then we can print something out. And, and then the name of the, the person that we found. So if we're searching, we want to find out who in this directory has the phone number 555-555-5555. Hopefully we now have a program that will allow us to do that. And maybe we'll, uh, we'll take out these print statements just to clean it up a little bit. 
it's cluttering our output. So I just added, you remember that the Octothorpe is a comment marker and comments are ignored by Python. So Python sees these and it just thinks that it's a comment now. So it won't execute those lines of code. Now when I run it, it just prints that one line, Matt, because Matt is the only person in the dictionary who has that phone number. Matt, what's your brother's name? If there's uh, somebody else that lives inside of uh, the same area and has the same phone number, hopefully our program will find all of those people. Both Matt and Jeremy have the phone number 555-5555-5555. So if you want to enumerate through all of the items inside of a dictionary, one easy way to do that is to get a list of keys from the dictionary and then use a for loop to enumerate through all of those keys. When you do that, you'll be given a variable that represents each individual key, and that variable can be used to index into the dictionary. This is a pretty common pattern that you'll see. It's so common, in fact, that Python has made it even easier to do so. This syntax will work for any list, but because we're specifically working with a dictionary, Python actually gives us the ability to do this without having to extract the keys first. We can extract the keys and the values simultaneously by using the items function inside of the uh, dictionary object. So we'll call names.items, and this will return to us. Actually, let's just uh, let's comment all of that out for now. And I'm just going to print name names dot items so that you can see what it does directory items and it's a little bit hard to see but you'll notice that the first thing here is a square bracket that means it's going to be a list so we have a list of some things the next thing is a parentheses which is what we saw when we were learning about tuples. So in this list, the first item is a tuple of things. And that tuple contains two values. The first thing in the tuple looks like my key. And the se second thing in my tuple looks like my value. And that's exactly what the items function does, is it gives you each key and value as a list of tuples. And we can enumerate that list just like any other list. <clears throat> and we can unpack the contents of that list automatically. I'm going to add, in, add back in these two lines of code so that we can see that we don't need this lookup anymore because Python is going to do the lookup for us. Oh, and I'll, I'll take this out to declutter our output a little bit. <clears throat> so print a name and then the corresponding record, a name, the corresponding record, a name, the corresponding record. And now that we have those, We can put our other code back in. And we can see that our program works exactly the same way that it did before, but it saves us a little bit of code. So the name and the record are keywords? No. We could call these whatever we want. Variable names. These are just variable names. And what we call them is totally up to us. Other questions? <clears throat> the last thing that I want to show you about dictionaries for now is the in operator, because it is also used pretty frequently. Here I have a directory that has a list of people. If I just want to check whether or not somebody exists inside of that list, 
we know that we can enumerate through the entire list and we could check to see if DOM exists inside that list, if uh, the, the user, if we iterate through our dictionary and if any of the users are DOM, then that means that DOM is in the list. And that would work. But Python gives us an operator to make that even easier. We can use the in keyword to ask if a specific key exists inside a specific dictionary. This is very handy as well. Okay, so those are lists and dictionaries and ways to uh, iterate through them. I want to, my next slide is actually about exactly that, but I want to give you another example that is maybe more pertinent to what you may be doing in your work. I'm going to make a list of data points. And I'm just going to make it a, a random, semi pseudo random list here. I just type in a bunch of values and put in commas. Let's say that I want to calculate averages, which of course are the mean, median, and mode. This is just a simple list. It's not a dictionary. Um, so I can enumerate through it just with the four item in data pattern. What I call this is totally up to me. I can call this datum, maybe that's better, for each datum, for each datum in data. Let's calculate the mean, the median, and the mode. So maybe we'll start with the mean. We'll need to add up all of the values in order to calculate the mean. So we'll need to keep a running sum. And sum is actually a keyword in Python, and I don't want to clobber that. So I'm going to call it a uh, total instead. I'm going to start it out as zero. Then I'm going to enumerate through my list. And for each datum in my list, I'm going to add that to the total. So I'm going to assign to the variable called total a new value of the current datum plus the current value of total. If you haven't programmed before, then this might seem a little bit confusing about why this is necessary. But I just want to take whatever the current value of total is and add to it the value of datum, and then store that back into the variable total so that it keeps a running total of all of those values. And let's, we're not finished yet, but we're going to execute this code just to see if it's running correctly. And actually, maybe we will. Uh, change our list slightly so that we can be more confident that it's actually doing this correctly. So we'll give it the values 1, 2, 3, 4, whose sum should be 10, right? Yeah, 10. Now let's see what we get. OK, so our for loop looks good. And just so you know, you usually won't see this kind of syntax in Python because there is a shortcut operator, the plus equals. Operator will do the exact same thing. It will take the value of total, add to it the value of datum, and store the result back in total. So now that we have that, if we want to calculate the mean, uh, calculate the mean, we know that that's the total divided by the number of items in our data, which we saw earlier we can find using the len function. So now we have a mean. That's very simple. What if we want to calculate the mode? 
recalling that the mode is the item in the list which occurs most frequently. So the first thing that we'll do is we'll maybe add some more items to our list. And we want to make sure that uh, one of the, we know what the mode is. So I added three to this list four times. So three will be the mode that we want. Any ideas how we might count the number of times each item in this list appears? Who has an idea about how we might do that? What we might use to make that work? Actually, so I showed you earlier that we can open the interactive Python terminal and we can ask for help with things. Another great place to go uh, for help that's much easier to read than the built-in is the Python website. There are official documentation uh, on the Python website that has all of the same information that you saw built in. The other thing that it has, that's the, the library reference. The other thing that it has is a tutorial that will walk you through um, basically everything that we're doing in this workshop, plus some other things. Um, so the tutorial is a great place to look for stuff, especially as a beginner. The other place to look is the library reference. Um, but to be totally honest with you, the fastest way to find what you're looking for is usually just to Google for it. And when you do, the Python official documentation is usually the first thing to come up. If it's not, it's Stack Overflow, and the answers there are usually pretty good anyway. But we want to specifically, we want to check to see if uh, if there's something inside of a list. So I just hit Control F and I typed the list, and this is the first thing that came up. I'm going to click on that. We can see in here, um, without even like reading through this stuff, I'm just looking at things that jump out at me. It tells me about the not, the in operator, the not in operator, which does exactly what you'd expect. It tells me that I can concatenate two lists. So if I have two lists and I want them to be one big list, I can use the plus operator to combine them. Um, it tells me about the length function. We saw that. It tells me about the min, the max, and it tells me about this function, count. Count will count the total number of occurrences of x in s. So this seems pretty promising, right? That's what we need to know in order to figure out the mode of a list. We will need to know the number of times that each item in the list appears. So this is very promising. Let's go back to our code, though. So we know that we'll need to do something like three, uh, or sorry, uh, what's the name of our list? Data.count three, so that we can figure out how many times the number three appears in our list. But how do we get there? I mean, we know that number three is, is the mean, but this list were arbitrary, then this we, we wouldn't know this ahead of time. Yeah, we'll need to do a loop. We need to look at every item inside of this list and count how many times each item appears. So let's do that much. We already have the start. We're already iterating through the entire list. So now let's count the number of times that each of those items appears. I'm going to create a variable called appearances. I'm going to set it equal to the result of the count function of the data list, sending it the value I want to look up, in this case, datum. So this isn't quite there yet, but we're going to run it just so that we can see exactly what it's doing. So here we'll print um, some information. And we'll go ahead and take this code out for now, just to keep our output uncluttered. So it's going to loop through for each datum inside of the list data. It's going to add stuff to the total. We don't really care about that. But it's also going to find out how many times that datum appears inside of the data list, put that value into a variable, and then print it out onto the screen. A little bit bigger. 
So we can see that the number one appears two times, the number two appears two times, three, four times, four, one, five, one, one, two, 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 three, four, three, four, three, four. You'll notice that there are repeats in here. It counted the number three, one, two, three, four times because it appears one, two, three, four times in our list. And that's what our loop is doing. Our loop is going through each item in this list and counting the number of times that each item appears in the list. So it shouldn't be too much of a surprise that we have duplicates because there are duplicates in our list. OK, so now we know that we can figure out how many times each item appears inside the list. How can we figure out, or how can we make the program remember which item appears the most times? So are you suggesting, so, so what do I need to add? So you need to add a variable, uh, you can call it uh, and be zero to start. And then you're going to compare mode to appearances. If appearances is larger than mode, then appearances equals mode. So that is going to tell you what the highest number of occurrences, uh -huh. the highest number of occurrences is. We have to do another one that says which number it is. You need to have another variable that's referencing datum that says like mode datum. So maybe we'll instead of calling this one mode, maybe we'll call this one most uh, or highest appearances, and then we'll create another one called mode. We'll also set it to zero for now. So if we find out that the number of appearances for our current item in the list, if that number is greater than the highest one we've seen so far, then this one is our new mode. Mode equals this current datum. And this number of appearances is our new value for the highest number of appearances. OK, shall we see if that works? If Daniel's algorithm is correct, it tells us that the mode is the number three, which occurs four times. It seems like it's correct. Obviously, we probably would want to test our code more thoroughly than just this one contrived example. But I think we can feel pretty good about the algorithm that Daniel came up with. One small change that I might suggest making is that uh, I want to introduce a new data type to you. Python, when you're creating variables, you, uh, when, you're, when you define a variable, you have to assign it some value. But that value may not have any meaning yet. So for example, before we start this list, let's, what, if, what if we didn't have any data? If we ran this program, it's going to run and it's going to tell us that mode occurs, uh, zero occurs zero times. And it's fortunate that we included the number of appearances because that's a red flag for me, right? If it occurred zero times, how could it be the mode? There must not be any data. But maybe we didn't have that lucky foresight and we just printed the mode. So here, oh, whoops, and we don't want that either. We just printed the mode. So here it tells us that the mode is zero. And maybe zero is a perfectly valid value for our data. This would give us no indication that our data set is actually empty. And it erroneously tells us that our mode is zero. 
instead of using zero, Python has a data type called the none type. And we can set things equal to that. So we can say that the mode, we can start out mode to be equal to none. And if there is data, mode will get reassigned to that data. But if there's not, Python will tell us that there is none. And this looks like, the, it looks the same as text, but this is actually a special value called none. And why, the reason why it's special is because we can ask questions about it. We can ask, if the mode is none, then print no mode could be found. Otherwise, print what the mode is. So now we have a, a program that can be smart about knowing whether or not there is no mode. Okay. I'm going to take out all of our other code, and I'm going to add back in our mean and our total, and we'll put the mode underneath that. So, so far, we calculated the, the total, we calculated the mean, we calculated the mode. So, we can calculate the median also. See how much we have left. Okay, what we're actually going to put a button in that because we have a few more slides to get through and we only have about an hour left. Um, so that can be your homework for tonight is calculating the median, writing a program to calculate the median. <clears throat> The next thing that I want to introduce you to are classes and objects. You've actually already been exposed to them through some of the code that we've written together so far. But we haven't created any new classes or objects yet. So when I say class, you might remember from yesterday, I introduced the idea of data types, where a variable can store a number or it can store a piece of text. And today we learned that variables can also store lists or they can store dictionaries. A class is just the definition of a type of data. So for example, when I say integers, I'm talking about a class of numbers. When I say strings, I'm talking about a class of data that is exclusively text. A class defines a type of data. If I said 14, then I would be referring to a specific number. That specific number can be thought of as being an instance of its class. 14 is an instance of an integer. My name, Dominic, is an instance of a string. <clears throat> so the Python standard library includes a bunch of classes and objects for us to make use of. But we can also define our own classes and objects. What we haven't seen too much of, when we think about an integer, you probably don't think about a lot of properties that an integer has, because an integer is a property, right? An integer is just a single value. What classes do is they allow us to assign multiple different values to a single object. For example, we can have a class that defines a type of person. And that person may be defined by their name, their age, their height, their favorite color, their favorite movie. All of those pieces of information can be collected as a single object. So as we assign that object to other variables, all of that information goes along with it. And besides collecting pieces of information about a specific individual, 
Classes can also define functions. You may also hear these referred to as methods. Methods are just functions that apply to a specific class. <clears throat> In order to reference either a variable that belongs to an object or a function, a method that belongs to an object, we use the dot syntax, which is what we saw earlier when we were working with lists. So we're going to do uh, a very simple example here where we will define some type of user. So actually, before I do that, I'll just point out in the code that I had here, data is a list. Remember, when we created our data, we created it as a list. A list is an object. Its class type is list. And it has properties and methods. One of those methods is called count. This is a method that belongs to this object. Um, I don't have any other examples in this code, but you've already seen this syntax. If besides using the standard Python class as an object, we can define our own. So to do that, we use the keyword class, the name of the class that we want to assign to it. So in this case, maybe we'll have a class of uh, participants. An open and close parentheses followed by a colon. The open and close parentheses uh, are actually optional. They make they're useful for when you want to define a hierarchy. And for example, participants are types of people. So maybe you've defined a people class before, and you want to say that participants are, are people. You can do that in Python. We won't worry about that for now, though. Just know that if you see a class name followed by an open and closed parentheses, it's not calling a function or defining a function. It's defining a class. And, oh, sorry, I call that participants. I don't want to do that because this is going to define what a single participant looks like. And for now, I'm going to introduce another keyword to you called the pass keyword. The pass keyword is useful in Python for when you want to start a piece of code, but you're not sure about what the contents of that code is yet. So I'm going to define this class participant. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Better? Yes. Uh, so I've defined class participant, and I'm going to put the, the word, the keyword pass inside of it just so that I can continue to write some other code down here without Python uh, complaining at me. If I don't do that, we'll see what happens. Python will tell me, hey, you forgot to indent stuff, because whenever it sees a colon, it's expecting some indentation and some code beneath that. But maybe I don't know what my participant class needs yet. So I'm just going to add the pass keyword, which just tells Python, it's cool. I know what I'm doing. Just let it go. Now it runs my code as expected. But here I've defined a new class. It doesn't have any properties yet, but that class exists, and I can make new objects, new instances of that class. For example, I, may, I might make a participant named Bob. I'll create a variable called Bob. I'll use my assignment operator again. And then the name of the class, followed by an open and closed parentheses. And then just to see what happens, I will print out to the console my variable Bob. Just to see what we get. And I did that. I don't know why I could do that. He's just a single participant, so I should use singular participant. So here it prints out this kind of coded message. It tells me that uh, there is a participant object at this memory location. This is what it printed out. By default, uh, when you don't tell Python how to convert your classes, your objects into strings, 
this is what it will look like when you try to print them out. Let's go ahead and make another one. An old Sally. She's also a participant. And uh, we'll print her out too. Oops. So now we have Bob and Sally, and you can see that they're, they are at slightly different positions in memory. So they're two separate objects. Both of them are a type of participant. If we want to define some methods, some functions for our participants, maybe our participants should be, this isn't a great example, but we'll use it anyway. Maybe our participants should be able to introduce themselves. Um, first, first, we'll just make them say hello. So we'll define a function inside of our class. And just like the functions that we defined yesterday, we start with the DEF keyword indicating that we're going to define a function, the name of the function, how we want to reference this function later, an open and close parentheses, a colon, and then the code that's associated with that function. Now, when you are working with classes, every function that belongs to instances of that class will start with the keyword self. And this is so that you can always have a reference to that specific object. So here, I'm just going to print hello, and then maybe also the value of self. So for Bob, I'll tell him to say hello. And for Sally, I'll tell her to do the same thing. And maybe we'll just do this. Hello, I am self. Now let's see what we get. So Bob, who was told to say hello first, says hello, I am, and then he prints himself, which is uh, his memory location. You can see it's different than the value last time. It'll be different every time we run the program. And then Sally does the same thing. She says, hello, I am participant object at OXO12305DO. OK. So now we see we can create instructions for our participants to follow. And when we do that, those instructions are specific to those objects. Sally, when Sally prints herself to the console, she prints her location. When Bob prints himself, he prints his location. They only have access to their own properties through this self keyword. So right now, they don't have any properties, though, um, which, is, which is why we get this like lame I am blah, 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 like they're robots. They're not robots, they're people. And people should have names. So let's give our people names. The way that I'm going to do that is through a special type of function called a constructor. In Python, constructors are used, are indicated with the underscore, underscore, init, underscore, underscore function name. That looks really, uh, kind of mysterious, but it's always the same for all of your classes. So you can just get used to using that. Just like the other function, the first argument is going to be self, parameter rather, the first parameter is going to be self. And maybe we also want, when we create a participant, we also want to tell them what their name is. Now, We've created a constructor for our participant class. What that means is whenever we create an instance of our participant class, whatever code is inside the constructor will be executed. So we'll demonstrate that here. I'm going to take this variable out just so that we can see what's happening. So in my program, I create a Bob participant, I create a Sally participant, and then I tell each of them to say hello. But when I create them is when this init function will be called. So we should see this printed before any of these. And we do. We see that the init method was called twice, once and twice. This isn't a very useful init method, though, that doesn't 
really do anything for us besides tell us that it ran. So now we can give it some more purpose. We're going to give our constructor a parameter called name. And this will allow us to store that variable inside of our class so that every object that's created will have a reference to that variable. And I'm going to, I'm going to call it my name just to avoid some confusion here real quick. So I'm going on the self object, which refers to the participant that's being created currently. I'm going to use the dot operator to access a variable called my name. And to that variable, I'm going to assign the value of whatever is inside of the name variable. That name variable is a parameter to my constructor, which means that I must specify its value whenever I create an instance of that class. So when I create this participant, I'm going to tell it, hey, your name is Bob. And when I create this participant, I'm going to tell it, hey, your name is Sally. So right now, we shouldn't see any change in our code. It's still doing the exact same thing when they say hello. But if I want to change this so that instead of printing out this uh, crazy code looking thing, I wanted to print their name, what should I type here? Any ideas? So you might be tempted to do name, but name, remember what we learned yesterday about scoping, name is a variable that only exists uh, inside of its function. Since it's a parameter to this function, it only exists inside of this function. So we can't use name because there is no name inside of this function. In fact, the only thing that this function has access to is this variable self. But self has this property, this attribute that we assign to it. So instead of using name, we're going to use my name. Because we told Python, hey, my name exists. It belongs to this object. So now anytime that we're referring to this object, it will have this property available to it. But we could do that outside of the scope of this participant. Um, yesterday, we talked about how scope applies to a function. Scope applies to a class as well. So inside of this class, Everything that's indented underneath the line class participant are the things that the class knows about. You'll see that there's no reference to Bob or Sally inside of this class. So we couldn't do Bob.myName because Bob doesn't exist inside of this class. And if we did, if, if we did, this would always refer to Bob. And we don't want that. We want it to refer to Bob when it's Bob and Sally when it's Sally. And that's what self allows us to do self is Bob when it's Bob and Sally when it's Sally. Now we have the output that we expected. We were able to create a participant. We specify the name of that participant when we create them. The participant remembers its name by putting it inside of an attribute, a variable that belongs to that instance of the class. And it can recall that variable later for other purposes. Other questions? Where? If it's inside the constructor, we can define new things. So age doesn't exist, but when we're inside the constructor, we're, we have the ability to tell this object, this new participant object, what attributes it's supposed to have. It's supposed to have an attribute called my name. It's supposed to have an attribute called age. So we're, this would be the same as like when you first define a variable. We're doing the same thing here, except we're doing it specifically for the instance of the participant that's being created. 
Bob's age will be 10 when Bob is created. Sally's age will be 10 when Sally is created. Mm -hmm. So I use the same name here as I use here, which is pretty common. Um, it's not colliding because this radius doesn't exist by itself. So for example, let me, uh, let me show you here. If I just did my name down here, Python would error on that because my name doesn't exist by itself. My name only exists as an attribute of self. So up here, self.radius is a different thing, a different variable than radius. After this assignment, they'll have the same value, but they still represent two different variables that exist in two different places inside of RAM. So we could, and we could do the same thing down here. We could use name instead if we wanted to. Any other questions? Classes and objects. What's nice about a class is that, I mean, you, you've seen that we can put multiple values. We can associate those things together. Um, not unlike a dictionary, but um, it also, unlike a dictionary, it gives us the ability to also define functions that are specific for each instance of that class. Um, but just like we can store these objects inside of these variables, we can put them inside of lists as well. So here I have a list that contains two participants. And I can write a loop. which affords you a lot of power. Last thing I want to point out about classes is that by convention, class names start with a capital letter, whereas variables and attributes and function names start with lowercase letters. You don't have to do that. Python will allow you to use lowercase letters for class names, but you shouldn't. Because any of the Python code that you read that you might find online or you might borrow or if you're working with somebody else, this is how everybody does it. Even though Python allows you to do it the other way, this is how everybody has basically agreed to do it. The benefit to using a capital a capital letter is that it's easy to see when something is a class versus a function because the syntax for creating an, an object from a class is the same syntax as calling a function. And if this were a lowercase p by convention, this now looks like you're calling a function instead of creating an object. Capital P, because of the convention, I know that I'm creating an object instead of just calling a function. There are lots of other conventions that apply to Python. One convention that I break that is officially recommended, we talked earlier yesterday, we talked about spaces versus tabs. Python recommends spaces, and I personally use tabs. Another convention that I break is that Python recommends snake case for, for things that contain multiple words. For example, we defined this method called say hello, the official recommendation from Python says that you should use an underscore to separate those words. I call it snake case because everything is lowercase and it kind of looks like it's slithering and it's Python and that's funny. Um, but I personally use what's called camel case. It's called camel case because it looks like it has a hump like a camel. Um, what you use is totally up to you. The only thing that's important for you to understand is that when you pick a convention, you need to stick with it. You, what you don't want to see is 
inside of the same code file where they've mixed different conventions. If you're going to use snake case, then you should use snake case everywhere. If you're going to use camel case, then you should use camel case everywhere. If you're going to do something completely, if you're going to use SpongeBob case, then you should use SpongeBob case everywhere. Totally up to you, but the official recommendation is snake case. I don't use it. You can do what you want. Just be consistent. Okay. Any questions about classes? Yeah. Here? Yep. Yes. Any other questions? Okay. As you continue writing code, so far everything that we've done, we've just done in a single file. And for very small, short, trivial programs, that's perfectly fine. Although, as you continue to add more code to your program, you will find that it's a lot easier to maintain if you organize your code uh, according to the functionality that some of the things are providing. Python allows us to do that with packages and modules. A module is any single Python file. So a file that ends in .py is considered a module. And a module can contain variables, functions, classes, everything that we've seen so far. This is a module. And because my file is named hello.py, this is the hello module. Besides modules, you can also create packages. If you're used to thinking of your file system as a directory structure, then a package is just a folder that can contain modules. And packages can also contain sub-packages. And those sub-packages can also contain sub-packages in any way that it makes sense for you to organize your code. <clears throat> if you want to reference code in a separate package or a separate module, Python has a syntax that allows you to do that. So here, I'm going to delete uh, these. Actually, I'm just going to take this class. I'm going to cut him out, make a new file. I'm going to name that uh, experiment.py. So now I have a module named experiment.py and another module named hello. And actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rename that hello. I'm going to rename it to main. So I have my main module, and I have this extra experiment module to provide some extra things for me. If I want to reference the things in this other module, right now I'm in my main module. If I want to reference the things in this experiment module, before I can do that, I have to first import that module into this one. You can do that with the import keyword. Once you've done that, everything inside of that module, in this case, there's just the one class, but everything inside of it can be accessed using the dot operator again. And you can see uh, Visual Studio Code is actually helping me out. I typed the word experiment. And it knows that I'm importing experiment from a module. And inside that module, there's a class called participant. My file. Main. Question? Module should be saved to the same folder, right? Yeah, you can save it in a subfolder, but then you're creating a package. And you can import things from packages as well. The syntax is very similar. You just add a dot. So if I put experiment inside of another folder called um, helper code, 
then I would just import from helper code dot experiment. Uh, for most of what you're probably doing, you probably just want to put all of your Python modules inside of the same folder so that they all live next to each other. If you have enough code that you're starting to deal with packages, then you, you may not even need my help anymore. So, yeah, another question. Again, following up uh, this question, okay, uh, if you are going to import uh, the modules or the packages created by someone else, mm -hmm. and uh, those modules are uh, frequently used, so you might not want to copy those modules or Python files into your own folder. How to do that? Yeah, so, so is your question about... Yeah, so we're so that's actually our next demonstration is using three standard libraries. So we'll we'll go ahead and, and jump right into that. So here you can see we've created our own module and we've referenced that module in our own code. And that can be useful for us because it can help us organize our code so that we don't have to have, you know, maybe this Bob, this participant class is maybe a lot larger. Maybe it has a bunch of other functions defined inside of it that we you know, multiple lines of code. And if we had all of that inside of this, we'd have to scroll all the way down just to get to the code that's actually doing things. So using a module allows us to put some of those definitional things in other places. Yesterday, we talked about doing an autopilot, uh, an autopilot uh, self-driving car. We could put that self-driving car in a separate module and all of the functions related to it driving forward, driving backwards, checking if there's an obstacle ahead, all of those things can be put inside of that module so that our main program only has to reference it. We don't have to look at all of that code at the same time. So that's useful for our own modules. But what's also useful is that there are a ton of modules already written for us. And many of the most useful ones exist in the standard Python library. Um, and so one of them that you may encounter, that you will probably encounter, is the time module. You can see Python is already aware of it. It already knows that it exists because it's built into Python. It's available always. And the time module is useful for doing a bunch of things. I'm just going to type time and then a dot so I can see all of the functions that it has inside there. Bunch of stuff related to time. Maybe one of the things that I want to do is I want the program to pause for a certain amount of time. So I'll call the sleep method, uh, function rather, on the time module. And it asks me to specify how many seconds I want it to sleep. I want it to sleep for three seconds, and then I want to print goodbye. Hello, I'm Bob. The program sleeping. After three seconds, it says goodbye. So you don't have to figure out how to do that sort of thing in your own code because Python people already figured it out and they made it available to you through the time module. Another thing that's useful in the time module is getting the current time stamp. So if you want to time how long it takes somebody to do something, Python allows you to do that with the time.time function. This returns the current time in seconds since the APOC, which is January 1st at midnight, 1970. It's basically an arbitrary date that was selected, and we count seconds that have occurred since then in order to figure out what the current time is. So let's, um, let's see what happens if we print this time.time .time to the screen. We get this big long number. This is the number of seconds, including milliseconds, that have occurred since January 1st, 1970, the, the APOC, the Unix APOC, if you will. The reason why this is useful is because we can take two timestamps. And we can do math on them. To figure out how much time has elapsed.
So that was very fast because the program doesn't take a very long time. Python is very fast, despite what you might hear. Uh, let's add some sleep in here just to make it take longer so that we see some non-zero value there. Uh-oh, what did I do wrong? Very good. So that took a little bit more than three seconds, which makes sense because we told it to sleep for three seconds. But we also did some other stuff in the meantime. So that's the time module. And this is how you can make use of it, by using the import keyword and then the word time. Python also allows you, this will, this will give you access to everything inside the time module through the name time. So if you want to access in, anything inside the time module, you would do time dot whatever. If you only wanted one specific thing from the time module, you can import that one specific thing. For example, maybe the only thing I care about in my program is the sleep function. I'm going to take out this uh, other stuff. Maybe the only thing I care about is the sleep function. If I only want that one thing, I can tell Python from the time module, import the sleep function. And what that does is, is it allows me to access the sleep function without having to reference the time module. Now, sleep exists inside this scope, and I can just call it directly. I don't have to do it through the time module because I just imported this one thing. Waits for three seconds, and then says goodbye. Question? So why would you want to do that? The only reason why you would want to do that is because it is more convenient to type sleep sometimes than it is to type time.sleep. It can also sometimes be a little bit less confusing. Some Modules have functions that are the same name as the module, like time, for example. Uh, so if you do from time import time, then you no longer have to do time dot time. You can just do time. You do have to be careful, though, because if you import this name directly, uh, what did I have there before? Sleep. And that means this already exists. And if you, I'm going to run this real quick so we can see that it still works. Oh, I'm Bob. Sleep for three seconds. If you redefine what sleep is, Python will tell you. It won't tell you that there's an error. He tells me here that my error occurred on line 11 down here. It totally allowed me to replace sleep. It was totally cool with that. But it's not cool with me trying to execute the number three as if it were a function. So you do run the risk of uh, clobbering names when you do this. So you just have to be aware of that. Um, the, the, the format that you use is totally up to you. One other way that you can import things, and I'm only going to show you this because you may encounter it when you're looking at other Python code, but it is not a practice that you should adopt. Um, another way that you can import things is you can import everything all at once. So this will take everything inside the time module and make it directly available inside of this one. So here, if I take out that line of code, here, I didn't import sleep directly, but I told Python to import everything from the time module so that I can call sleep or the time function or anything else that's inside the time module directly. And Python will totally allow me to do that. This is not good practice, though. One, because of the name collision thing that we just talked about. You don't know what functions are defined, and or maybe you do, but you're probably not going to look it up and make sure that all of your variables and functions don't collide with any of the things that you're importing. Um, and two, it actually is more inefficient because Python has to load all of the things from the time module into memory in order to make them available to you directly. So it could theoretically slow down your interpreter. Probably not in a way that you would ever notice, but it's just not a good practice.
Import time imports everything from time, but only through the time module. So if I just had that, I wouldn't be able to call sleep directly. I would have to call it through the time module. Yeah, good question. Any others? It is. Yeah. It is? Mm -hmm. As soon as as soon as this line of code executes, anywhere that it executes, it could even be inside of a conditional statement, or it could be inside of a function. At that time, the file time.py that's inside of your Python installation, the entire file and all of its contents are read by the Python interpreter and loaded into memory. And when you package all the file, the entire uh, everything you have with it, mm -hmm. then it only put the, the functions into uh, That depends on how you package. And that's sort of outside of the scope of this boot camp. But yeah, when you package your Python code, there are ways to package Python code so that only the things that you're using get bundled. So that if you distribute your program to other people, it doesn't contain a bunch of stuff that you're not using. Um, but we're probably not going to get to that uh, in this boot camp. And it's probably not important for most of your use cases anyway. So you have to do outside this program yes. to make it kind of like a standard? Yes. Like so that's for tomorrow. Oh, okay. Yeah. OK, there are two more standard packages or modules that I want to introduce you to. The other one, another one, is the math module. Math contains a bunch of math functions other than simple arithmetic, which is built into the Python language. The math module provides a bunch of other like trig functions, uh, all kinds of logarithms, exponents, the value of pi, I think is in here, the value of pi. to however many decimals that is. So if you needed to know the cosine of something for whatever reason, the math module will make that available to you. If you needed to know the value of pi, the math module can do that for you. If you needed to know the log of something, the math module makes that available to you. It is very useful. Another one is the whoops, random module. And as expected, it does exactly what, uh, what you might think. The random module let me, uh, has a bunch of functions inside of it for doing things randomly. So the most basic of which is just the random function so I'm going to call that and print it out to the screen just so that we can see what it does. 0 0.0999, 0 0.2837, 0 0.728. Every time I call that function, in fact, if I did it inside of, uh, if I did it multiple times here, each time it's going to be a new random number. And specifically, that random number is a value between 0 and 1. If you've programmed in other languages, this is often the only random function that you have available to you. So if you wanted a random number between 0 and 10, not including 10, you'd multiply that by 10, which gives you a decimal number, which you can then convert to an integer which we saw yesterday, just like we converted a string to an integer, we can convert a decimal number to an integer using the int keyword there. There, now I have two random decimals and then a random integer between 0 and, and 9. 
fortunately, this is pretty common. You'd want to do something like this pretty frequently and having to type this whole thing out when you just want a random number is a little bit cumbersome. So Python makes that a little bit easier for you with the rand int function. Rand int function allows you to specify a starting number returns a random integer in the range a to b, where a and b are the numbers you specify. So if I want a number between 1, 1, and 10, this gives me a random number between 1 and 10. And maybe we want to do that a bunch of times. 3, 5, 7, 1. This is actually a good time for me to introduce you to another type of loop. So before we saw loops in the context of lists, where we could loop through each item inside of a list, sometimes you may just want to repeat a set of instruction a specific number of times. Maybe we want to just create 10 random numbers. We don't want to enumerate through a list of 10 things. We want to create a list of 10 things. I'm going to create a list of random numbers. It's going to start out with no values. Then I'm going to write a loop that looks like this. Um, count in range 10. What this does, real quick, I'll show you in the uh, interactive terminal here. The range function is a built-in function. And I'll just show you, when I call range 10, well, it gives me a range object. But I can convert that object into a list. And you can see that list is just all of the values from 0 to 9. So Python doesn't actually, doesn't directly allow you to just execute a set of instructions a specific number of times. But because it allows you to enumerate through a list of things, you can just, on the fly, create a list of things that contains the number of items that you want to run through. So this will execute 10 times, with the value of count being the numbers 0 through 9. So here, I'm going to add to my list of random numbers by appending to it a random integer between 1 and 10. And then when I'm done with that, I'll just print all of the random numbers. There we go. 10 random numbers between 1 and 10. Maybe I want 100 random numbers between 1 and 10. Now I have them. Another nice, very nice function of the random uh, package is that it allows you to do things with lists. But if I want to shuffle my list, maybe I want to sort my list first. So I can uh, random numbers equals sorted random numbers. And we'll go back to just 10 of them. And we'll print that out uh, just to demonstrate that it is actually sorting our list. So it was random, but now we can see that they are sorted. If we want to reshuffle them, there is a function to do exactly that. Uh, random numbers. And we'll print it out. And we'll see what happens. When we do that, you'll notice that my list is now shuffled. So I sorted it first, and then I shuffled it. So if you're running participants for a study and you need a bunch of conditions and you want those conditions to be presented in a randomized order, you can just make a list of your conditions ordered and then use the random.shuffle function to randomly arrange the order of those conditions. You don't have to do it yourself. You don't have to write like some crazy for loop that swaps the positions of things. All you got to do is call this function. Um, the last thing that I want to show you from the random function is that it can also be used to pull out a random item from a list. That's through the choice function. 
The choice function allows you to specify some collection of things and it will give you a random one from that collection. So maybe we have uh, a list of movies again. Space Jam and uh, mm, Space Jam 2. We can print a random choice from that list of movies. And if we run this function, first time it picked Space Jam, the second time it picked Space Jam 2, the third time Space Jam again, and then Space Jam, Space Jam 2, you get the idea. What's that? Yeah, because why not? I wonder if there are any Space Jam themed restaurants. Okay. The next bit that we have to cover today is, are there any questions about modules and packages and how you can use existing modules and packages that are built into Python? When you are going through, if you're ever going through the um, Python tutorial, they list a bunch of the standard library and the entire standard library is listed in the uh, official documentation here. So you can see everything that's available to you there. And there's quite a bit. OK. <clears throat> Next, we're going to talk about file input and file output when you're writing programs for experiments. The experiments that you do will probably only be useful if you're actually collecting data. And sometimes having the computer collect the data for you is much more efficient than trying to do it yourself. So we'll demonstrate how you can write a program that creates an output file and how you can create a program that can parse through an existing file. And we'll also show you how you can use that um, in Excel directly. So we're going to write a quick program. We're actually kind of short on time. So instead of doing the full demo here, I'm just going to show you the file bits. So let's say that I had some piece of data, some uh, list of data. There we go. Actually, let's, let's be smarter about it. Let's We just saw this exact same thing. We have a random list of 100 data points. Let's say we want to write those 100 data points out to a file. This is built into Python. And the easiest way, there are a couple different ways to do it. But the easiest way to do it is with the keyword with. The reason why I like to use the with format is because Python will automatically open and close the file when we're done with it. If you don't close a file when you're done with it, then you may not, uh, it may not save all of the contents that you tried to write. If you use it with the syntax that I'm going to show you, it's guaranteed to close the file. You don't have to worry about that. So I'm going to say with, and then I'm going to open the file with the open keyword. You can see it's giving me hints there about, about how to use this uh, open function. I'm going to specify the name of the file that I want to create, data.txt. And then I'm going to specify the mode that I want to open this file with. In this case, because I'm creating the file, I'm going to open it in write mode. So I just specify a lowercase w in the mode there as a string, as a piece of text. So with open data.txt in write mode as, and here I'll specify a variable name which is just the name that I want to use to interact with that file within this code block. So I'm going to call it output file. Totally arbitrary. It's just a variable. You could call it whatever you want. I'm calling it output file. And now that I have that output file, it has a bunch of functions available to it, such as writing. So I can write some data. And let's just see what happens. Data goes here. Let's just run this program. 
it ran, no errors. And if I open up my uh, files here, we can see that now that file exists. I'm going to delete it again so we can, so I can prove to you that I didn't do that behind the scenes. I'm just going to run the program. We see that magically the data file now exists, and I can open it up and see what's in there. Data goes here. And that's exactly what I told it to write. Data goes here. OK, so I'm officially writing to a file. And to make this, I'm going to close this thing back up. I'm going to split my view by clicking on this button here so that I can look at my data file and my code file at the same time. <clears throat> so now I don't just want to print this line out. It's nice that I can do that. But what I really want to do is I'm going to write all of this data. So the, all of that data already exists down here. I want to write all of that data. So I'll do that with a loop for each datum in data. Alpha file dot write datum. And let's see what happens when I do that. It tells me, I have an error, it tells me that when you call write, you have to give it a string. You cannot give it an integer. OK, that's no problem. I can convert this datum to a string using the string function. Let's try again. There we go. We've got all of our things on, the, on a single line. That's not very useful. I can't tell the difference between 4 or 42. Or is this the number 9, or is this the number 93? So instead of writing just the value, I'm going to also write a line feed character. Line feed character is a piece of text, so it's inside of quotes. And then I use this special character, this backslash, followed by the letter N. Backslash is known as the escape character. And it just tells Python within strings that anything that follows that character, the character that immediately follows the slash, should not be interpreted as that character, but as some special meaning that's assigned to that character. That special meaning is already decided. The special meaning for n is a line feed. The special meaning for t is a tab. In this case, I want a line feed. So we'll run this again. And I can have all of my data on separate lines. There are 100 lines with data, and I had 100 pieces of data. So this is looking pretty good. Any questions about that so far? If I had, um, running out of time here, I'm going to add another piece of uh, data and for demonstration purposes <clears throat> we'll just make a list of names here um, me Matt Jasmine Adam and Ryan and when I append to the list of data. I'm also going to append to the list of names dot append. And I'm going to choose a random value from a list of people. So I should have a hundred names where each of those names is a random value from this list. And I want to print that out at the same time. When I write it to a file, I want to print the uh, name Yeah, so I'm going to, I'm trying to make this simple so that it's fast, but I'm actually making it a little bit harder. When I append to the datum, I'm actually going, instead of just appending a number, I'm going to append a list. I'm, yeah, a list. I'm going to append a list. The first thing in that list is going to be a random number. The second thing in that list is going to be a name, a random name chosen from my list of people. So... And actually, maybe I'll make that a dictionary just so that it makes a little bit more sense because lists are arbitrary. So data is going to be that point. Maybe we'll just call this data point. And person is going to be that random person. So here, I'm creating a dictionary that contains two keys. And I'm adding that dictionary to my list of data. And just to show you what that looks like, we saw this earlier, so it shouldn't be too much of a surprise. 
about what it looks like, but just so that we're all on the same page, we'll print it out here so you can see uh, that I made a typo somewhere. Oh, let me get rid of that. So there I have a whole bunch of uh, a list of dictionaries. Each dictionary contains a key for the data point and a person, a data point and a person. So now I can enumerate through that dictionary, just like we saw before. I'm going to have, uh, or actually, this is still a list. I have a list of dictionaries, right? So for each, we'll call this record now. For each record inside of this data, that record is a dictionary. That record is going to have a data point, and it's going to have a person. And I want to put both of those in my output file. So what I saw before, what I had before, was output output file dot write, and then the data point converted to a string plus a line feed. And I can do that same thing here. Write out the person. I don't need to convert person to a string because it's already a string, but I do need to print a line feed. Now I have each data point followed by the name. If I want them to be on the same line, maybe separated by tabs, I can replace the first line feed with the tab character. Now I have each record on a line. So the first item in that record is the data point. The second item is the name associated with it. This is random data, which is unfortunate because it's kind of meaningless to us. But hopefully, you get the idea of how I'm creating this output file from that. Any questions so far? So now I've created this output file. Maybe now I want to process this file. So I'm going to create a new file. I'm going to call this processdata.py. And I want to find out what the average data point is for each person in my, uh, in my data set. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that I know how to read a file. So just like before, when I opened a file with this with syntax, I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to say with function open. The name of the file that I want to open, in this case, it was data.txt, and then the mode that I want to use to open it. I don't want to write the file. This time, I want to read the file. So I'm going to use a little r there. I'm going to give it a uh, variable name. I'm going to call it input file. It's just a variable, so you can call it whatever you want. And then I can use input file dot any of these options that are available to me. To make this as easy as possible, I'm going to use the read lines function. And let's see what that gives us. If I just store that in a variable data and then print that to the screen, let's see what we get. Oh, whoops, I need to run my process data file. When I call input file.readlines, I can see that it gives me Here's where I started it. I can see that it gives me a list of items. And each item is the line from our file. Our file started with 44, followed by a tab, followed by mat, followed by a line feed. That's exactly what I see here. 44, followed by a tab, followed by mat, followed by a line feed. Next line, 60, tab, mat, line feed. 60, tab, mat, line feed. So if I wanted, I could iterate through for, day, for record in data, I can print that record. So now I'll see each record on its own line with the tab characters and the extra line feeds as well. Maybe I want to get rid of those line feeds. I can do that. Python lets me do that with the strip function, which belongs to the string class. So now I don't have that extra line feed between each one. But this is still one value. This is still one string. So what I need to do next is I want to separate these two values according to the tab, with the tab key as the delimiter, because I know that that's what's sitting between these two things. 
Python makes that pretty easy. I'm gonna first. I'm gonna take my record and strip it from that line feed. This will actually take any white space at the beginning or the end of the line and strip it off, um, which is very convenient. And then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to split that record using the split function, which is available for any string. And I'm going to tell it um, to split using the tab character. And I'm going to put the result of that in a variable that I'm just going to call info for now so that I can then print what that looks like. So now, each line is no longer a single string. Each line is a list of values, the first of which is what comes before the tab, the second of which is what comes after the tab. If these lines had four tabs, then each item would have four items in it, everywhere a tab separates them. So now that I have info, I'm going to extract the data point from that info. I know that the data point is the first item in info, which is indexed at zero. The first item inside any list is zero. And I'm going to convert that to an integer. I can print that to the screen if I want, just to prove to myself that that code works the way that I expect to. It ends with uh, 21, 15, and 48. I see 21, 15, and 48. Maybe I'll also extract the name, which is the second item in the list. Or if you'd like, it's the last item in the list. In this case, it's the same thing. We'll do something like that. So now we're processing each thing. We have access to each component independently. And um, just for the sake of demonstration, we'll maybe we'll, cal we'll go ahead and calculate the uh, the total for each person. And to do that, I'm going to use a dictionary. Because I want to calculate the total for each person, I'm going to create a dictionary that is indexed by each person's name. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use my in keyword to see if that person is already in the dictionary. Is that person already in the total scores dictionary? And actually, I'm not. Before I do that, I'm just going to pretend like it already exists. Total scores indexed by the person's name plus equals data point. So this will look up in the total scores dictionary. It will look up that person's name and add whatever value is in it to uh, the current data point. If I try to run that, though, Python's going to complain. And it's going to say, hey, this key math doesn't exist inside of this dictionary total scores. And it's, it, it did that on the very first line because there's nothing in the total scores dictionary. So first, I'm going to check to see if that name doesn't exist. If a name is not, is not in total scores. If it's not in there, I'm going to put it in there, total scores at position name equals zero. So now, if the name didn't exist, now it definitely does. And so adding a value to it should be no problem. Program runs. It doesn't complain. But I don't have any output yet. So now I need to enumerate through my scores for name, comma, score in total scores dot items. Print name as score points. Matt has 890 points. Me has 809. Ryan has 1,343. That's a landslide. Uh, and everybody else has points, too. So this is how you can parse through a file pretty easily in Python. Really, the only contra here is knowing that lines end with a slash n, and tab is a slash t. Although we could have used an, a literal tab character if our uh, editor allowed us to do that. Right now, mine is in space mode. So every time I hit the tab key, it just puts in a bunch of spaces. Yours is probably configured to do the same, which is why we use the slash t instead. It's also more obvious. When I see a slash t, I know that that's a tab. If I see a bunch of white space, I can't tell just by looking at it whether that's a tab or whether that's four spaces. I'd have to actually 
examine it more carefully to know. Actually, that looks like that's three spaces. So that's weird. Okay, so that is creating files and processing files. Um, one last bit before I cut you loose. Any file that you create, um, if you want to create a data file that you can then open in Excel, um, many people don't know that it's actually really simple to do that. You can take a plain text file and open it in Excel as long as it follows some format. One way to do that is to use commas instead of tabs to save your files. So I'm going to recreate my data file but it has commas instead. And I'm also going to, uh, instead of naming it .txt, I'm going to name it .csv. And I'm going to open uh, a window here so you, you can see what happens. So there's my data.txt file. I'm going to also turn on file extensions so you can see it's a .txt. I'm going to run this program again, which should now create a dot uh, where to go? A dot CSV, which has commas separating each value. Now I have a dot CSV, and if I open that inside of uh, inside of Visual Studio Code, data dot CSV, you can see it's just a plain text file. It's exactly the same as any other plain text file, but you'll notice that its icon changed to the Excel icon, so I can actually just open that file directly in Excel, and Excel figures out that commas mean columns which is very handy. So now you can do your math inside of here if, if you wanted to. Or you could import it into SPSS or R or whatever else that you're using. There are Python libraries if you wanted to create X, XLSX files. You can do that with Python. It's obviously more complicated than just creating a CSV file. So this is usually what I recommend. Plus, CSV files can be opened in any editor. You don't have to have Excel in order to look at the contents of it. OK, so we'll have to end there. Um, we didn't get to talk about exceptions and error handling today, but we will cover that tomorrow. Um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, otherwise, I will see you all tomorrow morning. You can search for my name on YouTube, or you can just write down this URL. Uh, where did it go? Thank you.